Okay, so I wanted to, in some sense, come out of um, relative hiding um, to discuss this article that was recently published in Current Affairs, and I'll leave a link in the description for anyone who hasn't come across it yet or who's interested in reading it. Um, it's a basically a hit piece on Slavoj Žižek, which goes into the reasons why the left should decouple itself from any um, relationship to or um, the author suggests a deification of uh, Slavoj Žižek and basically starts to suggest that he is a useless philosopher. And I just want to go through point by point this article because... Um, I feel like it gives at least me an opportunity here to articulate um, a few misunderstandings about uh, Zizek's work that can be useful for people who are interested in diving deeper into actually understanding Zizek's philosophy. Um, of course, this is going to be my perspective and my emphasis and my expertise and my, um, my bias is going to slant this analysis a little more into critique of this author's perspective on Zizek's philosophical work, uh, because that's, my, that's, that's the area I've concentrated most of my academic attention. Of course, I'm doing a lecture series on less than nothing, so um, if anyone's going to give a sort of a, an explanation of what Zizek's trying to say in his, in his seminal philosophical works. I think I'm qualified um, to do that. Um, I'm going to comment a little less on this author's um, confusion about what he calls Zizek's uh, racism, reactionary uh, politics, and uh, basically academic malpractice. I will comment on that a little bit, but it will take up a little bit less of this video. Um, and I couldn't help, while I was reading this article, uh, the, the, the man's name here is uh, Thomas uh, Moeller Nielsen, who I think is a philosopher of physics, um, who may be a doctorate or postdoc or um, professor, I'm not quite sure. But it was, <laughs> while I was researching this article, I, I mean, I... I, I couldn't help, and I want to make sure I'm clear here, although I disagree with the the author, um, this is in no way a, a hit piece on him or an attack on him. If anything, I would love a dialogue with him. Um, uh, and I couldn't help but, you know, laughing a lot while I was reading the article because I couldn't help but sympathize with, you know, my in person, my, my impression is that there's a certain cognitive predisposition um, which is probably quite common in academia, um, of people who would just be absolutely frustrated by reading Slavoj Žižek. Um, but I don't think that this is because Slavoj Žižek is, um, you know, academically, uh, you know, a charlatan or, or has nothing to say, but rather that he is such a novel and chaotic thinker uh, he is such a uh, unique writer and such a, um, I think, dense conceptualizer and such a, such a, um, such a master of dialectical uh, logic that a lot of people are not going to be familiar with how to approach this. Um, I think a lot of people are going to have a... A lot of people upon reading Zizek are going to have a spontaneous negative reaction because it, if, if Zizek has anything meaningful to say, then that would mean I have a lot of work to do on my, on my end to understand this system of conceptualization. And some people are just not willing to go there. Um, and I'm here speaking from personal experience. Like I, I have spent many years uh, diving deep into Zizek's conceptual um, territory in order to understand how I would make sense of this personally for my own philosophy. So I hope I can bring that out in this in this video. Um, so let me here start. I'm going to spend some time here uh, on the first opening of the article because 
he actually quotes a passage um, of Zizek, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, I'll leave a link in the description to a YouTube video where Zizek is talking about love and the quantum void. And, um, and, and Thomas Muller Nielsen, I'll just call him Muller Nielsen from now on, uh, basically gives this quote and then says, okay, are you in the camp of thinking this is profound? Are you in the camp of thinking this is insane nonsense? Or are you in the camp of, I have no idea what this is? And I, he is in the camp of thinking this is insane nonsense. Um, and I am in the camp of thinking this is actually quite profound. It's one of my favorite Zizek quotes, in fact. And so let me explain here what Zizek is trying to say. Um... Uh, well, one, uh, I don't think that when you break this down logically, that Zizek is saying anything that is that controversial, really. Um, the first thing is Zizek has a personal bias, which in fact colors his whole philosophy and which in fact is one of the reasons why he is so... Um, fascinated with putting German idealism and psychoanalysis into conversation, which is that he has a spontaneous negative view of the universe. He has a dark view of the universe. Um, of course, in psychology, there have been many studies that have shown that people, depending on their, <clears throat> uh, depending on many factors could be related to their development as a child, could be related to many early childhood experiences, could be related to other many personality metrics can have a spontaneously negative or a spontaneously positive view of the universe. In fact, I'm just uh, reading now William James's Varieties of Religious Experience, and William James even goes into detail of different varieties of religious experience where some people have um, a more positive view or a negative view, and comes to the conclusion, actually, that people who have a negative view of the universe, in fact, have, in some sense, a more complex view of the universe because they understand um, some of the more, uh, they, they integrate more of the, 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 the dark objective facts of the universe, we're all going to die, um, that reality is suffering, um, that uh, people who have a spontaneous positive view of the universe can oftentimes come across a little bit naive about these things. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's how he starts this quote. Um, and then goes into basically saying there is literally nothing. So, and this is going to be a theme in this video because um, Muller Nielsen seems to take extreme, um, seems to take an extreme, um, how would you say it? An extremely critical view of either the way Zizek approaches the concept of nothing or an extremely critical view of even taking the concept of nothing and the relationship between something and nothing as a serious philosophical problem. Um, and if anyone has read Zizek or is anyone an, an expert in understanding Zizek knows, um, one of Zizek's central philosophical driving um, forces is flipping and reversing in some sense this modern problem framed by Leibniz of why is there something rather than nothing and he flips it and basically grounds his philosophy in the question of why is there nothing rather than something and I really like that this that this flipping right because and, and and it clearly takes us away from a type of substantialist view of the universe like a Leibniz or a Spinoza would would have us ground our understanding of the universe in 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 substance and it does have a spontaneous affinity with modern quantum physics where substance or discrete particles sort of vanish into wave functions. Um, like, for example, physicist Sean Carroll will say it's not the particle is a wave or a particle, the particle is, or, or it's, not a, it's not the atoms are a particle or wave or both at the same time, is that they're waves. Um, and that the universe in some sense uh, in, at least in some uh, some versions of quantum field theory and standard versions of quantum field theory literally disappears into into nothing or what Zizek calls less than nothing. Um, and he has a quite sophisticated understanding of this relationship between something and nothing. So um, 
So claims the universe is literally nothing, that substance out there is, uh, is, is nothing, but then has a, a, a perspective on, okay, well, why do things appear? And then he grounds his, his, his view of the world out there as a type of, you could say, emergent voidism. So it's, you know, you would say like before the evolutionary worldview and before the evolutionary worldview really develops a sophisticated metaphysics, um, which you could say is still developing and, and, and many philosophers like Daniel Dennett, for example, are developing a more sophisticated metaphysics of um, evolution. Um, are basically saying here, emergent voidism is okay. Okay, the foundation of reality isn't a substantial thing, um, but things emerge. Um, and that's what basically Zizek is saying. Thing, thing, things, things emerge from this void. Um, you know, people like, for example, Lawrence Krauss, the physicist said the universe emerged from nothing, blah, blah, blah. So he's, my, my point here with this quote is, in, if you go through step by step what Zizek is saying, he's not saying anything that is... is radically controversial in you know he's putting in a in a poetic philosophically engaging language things which are commonly being discussed in modern scientific philosophy so here he's not step to me up into this point in the quote where he's talking about emergent voidism he's not talking about anything that is philosophically even controversial or 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 nor, you know, against any normativity that you would see in scientific philosophy. It's, it's stuff you would see on your average scientific philosophical um, bookshelf uh, in, in a modern bookstore. You know, like you can just pick up a Lawrence Krauss or pick up a Sean Carroll or pick up a, a Daniel Dennett, and they'll basically be talking about this type of stuff. So up to this point, anyway, um, he's not saying anything radical. Um, you could say he starts to inject here more radical language when he's talking about cosmic imbalance and cosmic catastrophe, that things exist by a mistake. Now, I think you would have to understand Zizek on a more sophisticated level to understand why he's introducing this the way he is. Um, specifically, like with Hegel's philosophy, mistakes are a part of the becoming of the absolute. And of course, Spinoza can't incorporate this. Um, for Hegel, failure and the mechanics of failure is essential for understanding truth, um, and 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 um, that that the universe is in a sort of cosmic imbalance is, I think, an important metaphysical point. Like because there's so much ideology today which would presuppose, often unconsciously, would presuppose that we're trying to get to some balance or some equilibrium, that everything will be all right, everything's going to turn out fine. But again, Zizek has a darker view of the universe, and this is inscribed in his metaphysics, there's a cosmic imbalance, meaning no, not everything's going to be all right. Everything is going to fall to pieces. Um, uh, things are spontaneously in disequilibrium. Uh, like, we are in turbulence we are 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 constantly in a contest a struggle a fight um and 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 you know i think you can easily when you have a metaphysical view that's informed by evolution i think the i mean the most obvious thing to conclude is that yeah uh the universe is a catastrophe like we live in a universe that operates by natural selection like to me, that's obviously a catastrophe, like on the level of biology or on the level of culture. Like it's so, it's so, um, it's so like the, the mechanism, the generation of new things, the generation of, of any progress or any, any movement um, operates by principles of death and operates by principles of, of, of producing variant informational copies of things and having 99.9% .9 of them fail. So it's, it's, yeah, that, I mean, I think that having an existential view that that's catastrophic is totally reasonable. I mean, that's my <laughs> spontaneous assumption about the universe anyway. Um, and it's difficult to cope with um, existentially. Um, and then, okay, so then he says, okay, well, because of this, how do we counteract this? Um, and I guess, I guess I'm, again, spontaneously in agreement with Zizek, like, yeah, we live in a stupid universe. 
we live in a in a in a crappy universe. How do we counteract this? It's it, you know it, it's it's not a nice place to be. You know we're we're constantly in competition. We're constantly fighting for our survival. Um, and he says that we have a name for counteracting this, and it's called love. And love is actually the the most real love. And I mean, I don't even I I presuppose that I don't understand real love, and I presuppose that I'm not capable of embodying real love. I presuppose that love is the hardest thing for a human to do. Um, but I also think that love is the most important thing to do. Um, and the idea that love would be the principal mechanism to counteract the stupidity of the universe is, I think, also something that many religions would have unconsciously embodied in their structure. Like if you even take Christianity, um, as, as a good example of this is like love as the transcendental principle is at the foundation and that it, it inscribes um, and calls for our ability to love ourselves, our neighbor as, as, as our essential task and duty on this planet. So I don't, again, I, I don't see anything ridiculous here either um and now the crucial notion where i agree with jakir is in regards to the form how he's articulating trying to articulate and this is where i think jakir does now up until this point he doesn't say anything necessarily that's against um anything you would see in standard scientific philosophy today but then he does start to articulate something which I think is the precise important point of this whole passage is this distinction between this universal love and a love which is more violent. Uh, but I would say a love which is more um, selectionist, a love which is more, um, uh, I don't know how to, how to say it, but a love which is more exclusionary because what 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 is horrible about i would say naive notions of love is this precisely i love the world universal love like the people who will say i love all of nature i love the planet i love all human beings and i think this is important actually for the left because you'll always hear leftists saying that they love immigrants or they love all people on the world or they love nature. They want to save nature from, from, from ecological catastrophe. And I never buy this. I don't think this is serious. Like, I don't think, I don't think it's genuine. Like, I think they're inauthentic when they say these things because I don't think that's real love. And, I, and my, my spontaneous personal view is that what progressive leftivism suffers from is narcissism. Like that what they call, what many, le not all leftists, I'm just generalizing here massively, but like a lot of, I encounter, and, and also self-critically, you know, like I'm, I'm not, like I'm not, I'm, I'm spontaneously leftist in my politics. And I would say that what leftism often suffers from is this confusing, love for the planet and other human beings with a type of narcissistic self-projection and wanting to be perceived as a good person um, and wanting to be perceived as a morally virtuous person. But I think that the way love really works is more like what uh, Zizek is saying here. One, I think it's very authentic. I agree to say, I hate the world or I'm indifferent to the world. The world is stupid. Like that, that's that, like reality is stupid. I agree with this also. It's just out there, uh, whatever. It's, it's, it's this indifferent background. And I think this is also what here, it could be, again, something that someone who doesn't understand Zizek or doesn't understand Hegel wouldn't get is that nature is just a moment in the process of ideal sublation. So once you've processed nature out there and you've gone through that motion, it's just out there. It's not even, it like, it's already lost. It's just a moment of sublation. So, um, but the point is, and Zizek's point here, and this is where I think he separates himself and makes an important distinction in relationship to modern scientific philosophy is, love means I pick out something. It's again, this structure of imbalance, even a small detail of fragile interference. I say, I love you more than anything else. 
This is the crucial point. And I think uh, Moeller Nielsen here doesn't really get this point because in he, he articulates some principles here of this statement down at the bottom of the essay. And you'll see he doesn't understand this point here of this structure of imbalance being embedded in, in love, counteracting this structural principle with love as the action. It's not I love the whole planet or the earth. But you just take out a small, fragile person and say, I love you more than anything else. He's saying, this is real love. That's how actually love works. Like if you take, for example, um, like the love of my mother to me. Um, my mother doesn't love all children equally. No, she says, this person here is special to me even if he's fragile, even if he's ridiculous, even if he makes stupid mistakes, even if I know every gross detail about his becoming, I still love him more than all the other children. And this is also how we love in romantic love or sexual love. You don't love, you don't really love all human beings. You pick out one person or a small group of people or your best friends. You have a small group of people, small, fragile, individual people. You say, I love you more than all the other people. Like that's how it, that, I mean, and, and he's saying that is why it's evil. But again, it's tongue in cheek, you know, it's tongue in cheek because what, if you understand Zizek's philosophy deeper, what you know is that Zizek articulates that good comes out of evil, that evil is primordial to good. That's the structural imbalance. So, So yeah, I mean, so again, in the camp, I fall on that this is this is this is a, a very interesting philosophical passage. Um, of course, in order to understand it in its full depth, you have to understand Zizek's philosophy better than than I think Muller Nielsen does. Although you know, here I'll say that Muller Nielsen does go into extreme depth with his analysis. Here, it's not a, I mean, and I disagree with a lot of it, but. Um, so then he levels, let me just say here before I go down to the section, then he says basically that the reason why the left should uh, distance themselves from Zizek is, um, let's say, well, here you see racism is one of the charges. Um, racism is one of the charges. Reactionaryism is another one and repetition and academic malpractice. So I'm, again, I'm going to focus more on ontology and Zizek's ontology and philosophical work towards the end of this article because that's my expertise. And honestly, I don't like really care as much about these topics. I will, but I, I am going to say uh, my quick version on each of these things because my view is that Zizek is so necessary for the left because precisely because he goes against like what I see anyway as the problem with the left, which is their political correctness, which is their emphasis on race and gender so much and not really getting at to the core. I think we need to we need to better understand what race and gender are instead of I really believe that as soon as we start from the presupposition of moralizing race and gender before actually understanding it's it gets in the way of really understanding what race and gender are that's 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 my view but it's not going to be the focus of this video um but he will say my only thing i'll say about his critique of Zizek, honestly on on the on the topic of racism is that the things he pulls out as racist and calls racist is another example of the problem of the left today because the things he's the things he's critiquing Zizek for mostly in in Zizek's book against the double blackmail in my view aren't racist it's if anything you could say he's xenophobic like maybe he's he's maybe he's like he, specifically against islam his critique is basically saying that Zizek uh generalizes islam uh as against free speech and women's rights so he's saying basically that Islam and Islamic culture has something inherent to it which is incompatible or contradictory with Western notions of free speech and Western notions of women's rights. And then he's calling that racist. But that's not racism. Like, that's my thing with, with a lot of modern leftists. They, they, they jump so quickly to calling things racist which aren't racist. And well, that's my view anyway. And, and maybe, you, maybe you disagree with that. And if you disagree, I'd like to hear from you. I mean, I'm open to changing my mind about those things. But, that, but 
it's basically saying, you know, uh, that 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 here there's a dynamic at work. Now, I would probably phrase this relationship between Islam and the West a little differently, but I do think that Islam does have at least some, you can't deny that there are some variants of Islam, some very vocal and some very, um, I would say, fundamental variants of Islam, which have issues with free speech and which have issues with women's rights, which you would see as pinnacles or principles of Enlightenment Western civilization and and um, many of the civil rights movements that 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 define the 20th century, including first and second and, and now third wave feminism. Like, and 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 for me, that's something like I would love to see a larger conversation about is how. How can, how can you both support third wave feminism and um, not be very critical of the way women can be treated or are treated en masse within certain Islamic cultures? I just don't understand that. So that's that's the 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 racism the racism bit, which is my main thing about what he says about Jishikon racism is is that it's really not racism, and you know, if anything, he says some culturally insensitive things, and says that there's a conflict between Western values and Islamic values, which I think, um. You know, has some truth to it, but I'm I'm not going to die on that on that hill. I'm not going to die on that hill. I don't I don't care enough about that. So, uh, in regards to reactionaryism, again, I, these main things I, I'm not too. I mostly care about Zizek's ontology, but uh, in regards to reactionaryism, my stance on this. So, what what he says basically is that. Um, oh, he supports he supports reactionary right wing politics like he supports Donald Trump. He's inconsistent also with not supporting Marie Le Pen. Like, and I agree with that actually. Like, I think if Zizek supported Trump, he should also have supported Le Pen, um, saying like, okay, well, if the right, if like the in, like what what Zizek's saying here, and I and I see the logic of what Zizek's saying, I, and I, I think there's some some truth to it as well, which is if if you support an extreme right-wing political figure, that this would be a motivational drive to really think a new left to counteract that figure, and that if we voted in the, uh, the, the establishment candidate left-wing figure, like a Hillary Clinton or a Macron, who's centrist, really, they're both centrist, really, in my view, um, then that wouldn't be, it would basically be a continuation of the status quo and that basically you create a right-wing chaos and that from this right-wing chaos, potentially there could be a reinvention of the left. And I see the logic there because like to me, the left needs to rethink from first principles. And they have to be willing to say, okay, we're like the very, the very principles of our political philosophy are wrong. And the very principles of our political philosophy need to be rethought. And I think on the, on the levels of identity, personally, um, the way the left mobilizes identity and talks about identity, I think is part of the problem. That's my view. But, and then, so he's saying Zizek is reactionary. Um, but I think Zizek is just dialectical. Like if like and I think that the 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 leftists who don't like Zizek's dialectics here of understanding the relationship between the alt right and the progressive left are just being, in my view, being ideological. You know, like they're they're not really they're not really thinking through, like and and it's not and it's not that if you disagree with Zizek you're wrong or that you should agree with Zizek that, oh, he's that, that, like his dialectical analysis was so precise, you can't disagree with it. I don't, it's not saying that either. It's just saying like, it's not grounds for saying leftist political organizations should have nothing to do with Zizek because he's articulating a dialectic of the relationship between left and right, saying that alt-right chaos could lead to an emergent new left from new principles. I think that's totally reasonable. So that's that's what I have to say with that. 
Um, and then repetition and academic malpractice. So he basically says uh, that Zizek cites a lot of the same authors, topics, and he says he has lax personal standards for academic practice, that he cites Wikipedia or um, talks about things where he has low expertise or he recycles paragraphs, like so he self-plagiarizes. Uh, so let's let's take that by one by one, maybe. Um, so in terms of citing the same authors or topics in books, like, and here, I'm going to show here the, he has a chart of the persons and topics that Zizek will reference a lot. So one, like, you could technically do this with any philosopher. Like, if I took, like, like let's say I took every book by Daniel Dennett. Or let's say I took every book by Steven Pinker, or say I took every book by whoever your favorite philo modern philosopher is. Um, well, jo like Jordan Peterson, for uh, anyone, um, really. Every author has a few figures or important influential people that structure their thinking. Like, like could I not take Daniel Dennett and say, he's always referencing Charles Darwin. Like, he, he really likes Charles Darwin, or he really likes Richard Dawkins. Like, he's, he, he the, the number of times he says Darwin, the number of times he says Dawkins, the number of times he says, you know, whatever other evolutionary, you know, uh, Huxley, or, you know, wh whatever great evolutionary thinker, you know, Dennett will reference, or, or, or whatever, or, you know, for, for, for Pinker, or it, for Pinker, it might be, you know, whatever great linguists that Pinker is referencing over and over and over again, you know, it, there's going to be a distribution and there's going to, every philosopher is going to have the people that influence them more than others. Like, for example, if it was Peterson, how many times does he reference Jung? How many times does he reference Nietzsche? You know, for example, you know, like, you know, so, so saying that Zizek cites Hegel and Lacan and Badu and Freud and Marx is like, yeah, you're understanding the structural logic of Zizek's philosophy. So in, un in order to understand Zizek, you have to understand Hegel, you have to understand Lacan, you have to understand Badu, you have to understand Freud. You have to, you, and, and if you don't, so maybe you haven't read Hegel and Lacan and Badu and Freud and Marx, or you're not aware of them deep enough to, to make a, a sophisticated academic comment on them, or, you know, you, or you're just too, too lazy or, or to, to even bother to understand, like, oh, I've got to read Phenomenology of Spirit now, or I've got to read The Akrits, or I've got to read, you know, Theory of a Subject, you know, in order to understand what the hell Zizek's getting at, you know. But that's, you know, the, and this is my, the central problem with this article is that people, like, what, what he's doing in my view, and this is not a personal attack on him, but it's just a, a structural that I, my view on what this, the problem is here, is that people read someone they don't understand, and then they, they assume that the lack is in them, as opposed to in yourself, and I think that's, again, the problem with the left. The left is always, the modern left is always assuming that the lack is somewhere out there instead of it's in them. It's like, you got to look closer at yourself. Like the lack is in you. You know, it's far more likely that the lack is in you than the lack is out there. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I just don't think this is, that you can criticize Zizek for having certain philosophers or having certain topics which... Like that doesn't delegitimize you as a theorist. It just means you have a particular slant. Like for example, my PhD supervisor uh, will quote Ashby. You know, he'll quote Ashby. He'll quote Bateson. He'll quote. You know, there's a, a certain or uh, for example, a Herbert Simon, right? So like you know, like th that would be his triad, right? Like and I, I like Ross Ashby, Norbert Wiener, uh, Herbert Simon. Gregory Bateson. These are the people I'm going to reference most. It's people I know most about. You know, I, I'm interested in cybernetics, so I'm constantly talking about cybernetics. I'm constantly talking about evolutionary theory. It's not a critique against you as a as a theorist. It just means that you have a certain particular theoretical perspective, um, and that he has topics which will come up often. Like, like yeah, Zizek is a social 
a theorist of capitalism and communism, like one of the things he focuses on the most is the the con the conflict, the divide between capitalism and communism, and uh, and thinking tension and antagonism, and thinking the, the the relationship between our psyches and 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 political economy. That's one of the foundations of his ph philosophical work. It, it's not a critique against him to be constantly thinking about those things. Like it's not a sub or like you know he like this author is particularly concerned that Zizek brings up sex a lot, you know, <laughs> and and I think my view is that I'm particularly concerned about how academics don't talk about sex or don't take sex seriously as a topic. I I it's one of the things I pr appreciate the most about Zizek is that he talks about sex and sexuality and sexuation in a way that's incredibly original, that's incredibly unique, the way he intersects. And of course that's derived, that's, of course that's derived from Lacan. Because if you read Hegel, there's no sex in Hegel. You know, where is there sex? There's sex in Lacan. And so you have to read Lacan, you have to, oh, and that obviously comes from Freud because the Freud is a theory of the libido. So if you don't understand those things and you don't understand what Zizek's saying, Again, the lacks in, 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 in the author here, in my opinion, not, not, in, not in Zizek. Um, then he cites Wikipedia. It's okay, like, yeah, sometimes Zizek has cited Wikipedia, but I mean, I've gone through less than nothing and I've gone through absolute recoil in insane detail. And Zizek is always referencing the most cited literature on the topics he's talking about. Like he's citing... You know, he's citing Kant directly, or he's citing Heidegger directly, or he's citing, you know, if he's talking about cognitive science, he's, he's citing Daniel Dennett directly, or he's citing uh, Douglas Hofstadter directly. Like, like, you know, has he cited Wikipedia? Are there a few things in his enormous edifice of writing where you could say, you know, maybe you shouldn't have cited that that way? Yeah, but okay, you know. It's certainly not grounds for saying the whole left should disconnect from Zizek. And then in regards to self-plagiarism self and recycling paragraphs, I've seen that too. It's not, you know, I personally don't care. It's just something I don't take too seriously, I guess. Um, let's see, self-plagiarizes. Um, yeah, so here's a, he gives the examples here of all the times it's been self pleasure. I mean, I mean, one thing I'll say is I'm impressed by the amount of research here, like and 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 the attention to detail. Like he's he's certainly taken a lot of time with this, um, and and I guess I just don't. I mean, I guess it's something where I would say it's not grounds for the left distancing itself from Zizek, but it's something like I would say. There are some books that I just think are lower level Zizek, like like Zizek will pop, pu publish a lot of popular stuff that I don't th that I personally don't take too seriously, um, and like sometimes probably he's just publishing things so quickly that he could have taken more time with the, with them, you know. But they're not his major serious works, so I mean I don't really care. Um, so here I'm not gonna again I'm not gonna die on that. On that hill, uh, yeah, I'm just not going to die on that hill. Um, let's see, charlatanism. <clears throat> see what he says about charlatanism. Uh, all I wrote down in my notes when I was going through the charlatanism section was that again, I, I I couldn't stop laughing when I was when I was in the the cafe reading it because the main thing I was laughing is is because in some sense I'm sympathetic with this this guy was Moeller Nielsen, and I would like to have a conversation with him more than anything else. It's like because again when I was reading it, he's just he he's he's. Here's a selection. He's a selection. He just picks out selections of of sentences from Zizek that he's just like. But this has nothing to do with the main thesis of the book. And what is he talking about? And I was just like laughing because it's like, I I, I can't put my finger on it, but it's almost like, like, the meme of Zizek or the the comedic element of Zizek is being missed or or, you know, it's kind of like. It, there's just something so comical, so comical about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when when you pull out these sentences one and one, just out of like pulling pulling out these random Zizek sentences and just reading them out of context, it's like they're it's just hilarious. I just couldn't stop laughing. 
uh, who who then really deserves the Nobel Prize? Or the first and obvious Lacanian reading of La La Land would be to see this plot as yet another va- variation on the theme of there is no sexual relationship, which I agree. <laughs> it's just funny. Okay, but then I come down to like less than nothing. So this is like actually my area of expertise. So like. Um, and I think this is like the funniest, not the funniest, actually. The funniest was the charlatanism thing. I don't care about that. Um, but coming down to less than nothing, because as you know, I, I'm doing a video series on less than nothing. And I'm one of my, one of my main philosophical focuses is, is to try to understand both less than nothing and absolute recoil for as, as, as their modern philosophical uh, moment. What do these books mean in their, the modern philosophical moment? I think it's extremely important. So I can actually, I, my my attempt here is not to, you know, like Muller Nielsen here just seems confused and he just doesn't understand these works. Um, and again, like my problem is because he, he doesn't understand these works and then he's assuming therefore Zizek must be a moron. Um, which he actually concludes towards the end of this article. He says, well, because I don't understand these things, Zizek must be a moron. And it's just like, no. <laughs> it's like, no. It's, like, that, that's never the, that's n- like, as an intellectual, that's never the route I, I would ever go. Like, if I read something and I don't understand it, I, I would never assume uh, the problem is in, 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 in the thing I don't understand. Like if I understand something and I disagree with it, then I would start critiquing it. But if I read something and I don't understand it, well, I said, well, I would go to try to go to someone who actually understands it. That's to me the logical. And then if you did, then if, then if you go to someone who understands it and then you, then you can actually critique it. Well then, yeah, well then you understood it and you can, you can critique it then. So that makes sense. Um, so again, so the, the thesis of less than nothing here, he's, he, so he brings this statement up from less than nothing and he doesn't, he doesn't understand it. So, uh, less than nothing endeavors to draw all the ontological consequences of this epersi moave. Um, here is the formula at its most elementary moving is the striving to reach the void. Namely things move. There is something instead of nothing, not because reality is an excess in comparison with mere nothing, but because reality is less than nothing. So again, he's flipping, he's, what he's trying to do here is flipping the standard modernist metaphysical question of why is there something rather than nothing? And instead he's saying, why is there nothing rather than something? And he's saying this is an important question. And his main, what he's saying here, when he says movement is striving to reach the void, you can think about this as in any elementary activity that human beings do. So Whenever we try, whenever, like, for example, whenever we eat or whenever we're looking for a sexual partner or whenever we're, uh, whenever we're looking for a job or we're, or we're bored and we're looking for something to do on the internet, for example, uh, you could phrase this as we're trying to fill a void. Like there's something lacking, there's something missing. This is actually, a, this is, this is a very simple but very important existential point. And again, uh, in modern in modern scientific philosophy, this is coming up as an important point. So, for example, what I'll always reference is Terence Deacon's *Incomplete Nature*. I would definitely recommend for this guy to read Terence Deacon's *Incomplete Nature*. It might Zizek might make more sense after reading that book because what Deacon does is basically ground. He says what's missing in science is that science doesn't understand absence, and that's what Zizek's basically saying here. Science doesn't understand nothing. Um, or ph- and, 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 you know, well, philosophy and the, you can ground Zizek's work in a long trajectory, which he's explicitly referencing, like Hegel, like Heidegger, where they uh, problematize nothingness, uh, like Hegel's dialectic is based on that. Um, so he's saying movement is to try to fill a void, basically. Movement is striving to reach the void. Um, and that's also why he goes to Freud's death drive, for example. Um, and saying that all of this movement to fill the void always fails. So, uh, so this is where he would situate his, his ultimately his critique of Hegel with sublation and idealization. So, um, 
and 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 all of all of Zizek's very precise views on desire and what makes us happy and what makes us non unhappy all can be situated here. So, for example, our failure to properly sublate or idealize this void is not recognizing that what we what we really want is the void itself. We so it's a, it's it's just a perspectival shift on nothing, or it's a perspectival shift on absence. You know, like you don't want the thing you think you want. Like it could be food, it could be a sexual partner, it could be a job, it could be whatever. That thing you're thinking will fill the void will is not going to make you happy. It's this it's a spurious infinity. It's an endless endless search for the for the lacking object to use the Lacanian terminology. Um so then he says the consequence there is something because reality is less than nothing. So now this is this Understanding this is so important to understand the rest of Zizek's most sophisticated philosophical work because what he's setting up is a precise dialectical triad between something, nothing, and less than nothing. And less than nothing is a very difficult concept to understand, but it's also, yeah, it's very sophisticated philosophy. So you have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Now, my understanding of less than nothing is that it's kind of like images and fiction. Images and fiction are less than nothing. If you think about images in fiction, why are they less than nothing? Well, images in fiction are not something, you know, and in some sense, they're more than something. Like if you think about, for example, Spider-Man. Well, Spider-Man isn't something and it's not nothing. You know, Spider-Man doesn't exist in my material reality. There's not actual person Spider-Man who can climb up on the walls and, 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 and shoot webbing out of his wrist and has spidey sense. Spider-Man doesn't exist. Spider-Man's a fiction. But Spider-Man is in some sense in excess of something. So Spider-Man is a filler of the void here. This is why Spider-Man's less than nothing. So, and less than nothing, this filling of the void is mediating our reality. Like you can't, his point is you can't take this away. Like the fact that reality is 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 filled with fictions and images is you can't scrape it away. It's it's and it's you get into very very sophisticated philosophy when you try to understand this. Like like and so his basic point is that religions, science, capitalism, all of these things are less than nothing. They're images mediating the void. Um, there's, you could say there's subtractions of the void or fillers of the void, but what they're really doing, and this is an important philosophical point, is that they're exploiting or harnessing negativity, depending on your particular view. Like if you hate capitalism, you would say they're exploiting negativity. If you like capitalism, you say they're harnessing negativity. They're using it to, but he's saying that, 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 that the reason why these exist is because reality has to conceal its emptiness. That reality isn't doesn't have a full substance. Like reality, shit, basically. Like it's like I always give the example personally of like the difference between uh, being a child, like say five years old, a child on Christmas morning. You know, you feel like there's a full substance there. Like Santa Claus, a magical man, goes around all breaks all space time coordinates and, and has a total abundance of gifts to brings you, uh, and it's just like complete joy and ecstasy of like this moment. And then you realize actually Santa Claus doesn't exist, and there you just feel the emptiness of reality, like shitty reality, right? Um, but then what the thing is is that there's this negation of negation. So a Hegelian philosophical tool, a negation, which is you can't get rid of fiction or fantasy. You can't say, oh, well, Santa Claus doesn't exist, so we shouldn't, like, we shouldn't have a Christmas tree and we shouldn't have presents and we shouldn't celebrate this with family and, sh and show love to each other. No, they're necessary appearances. It's appearance qua appearance. So you need fiction. It, reality needs to be supplemented by fiction. That's his, that's his point. So it's... So then he says, confused? I certainly was. Well, I hope you're not as confused anymore. I, I think I described that pretty pretty clearly. Um, <clears throat> so then he asks some... some he always, he's always asking these rhetorical questions, which I just want to... <laughs> it's just ridiculous. 
in my view. So like, so he says, how can something exist and yet simultaneously nothing exist? And so my answer would be, something is mediated by nothing with less than nothing. It's a dialectical triad. That's his philosophical system. I'll repeat, something is mediated by nothing with less than nothing. Um, and again, these are fundamental philosophical questions that many philosophers have tried to approach. And this is Zizek's unique approach to them. And so he says, who is supplementing reality by fiction if less than nothing exists? So here, this, so his question here is so poorly structured here. So he's saying, who is supplementing reality by fiction if less than nothing exists? He says, there is first, and this is a Zizekian principle, there is no who. There, no agent is supplementing reality by fiction. So that's the first principle. And this is the principle is, there is no big other. There is no other who is supplementing reality by fiction like God or something like that. There is no who. So the question is fundamentally wrong. And then saying, um, and fiction is less than nothing. Uh, so he says, if less than nothing exists. He said, no, fiction is less than nothing. So the question is really poorly worded and structured. And he says, are novels being written by things that don't exist? So I have here an answer for him. Uh, novels are being written by some things, humans, in relation to nothing, the void of their own recognition, desires, etc., mediated by less than nothing images. So again, it's a dialectical triad. You have to, and if you're not willing to go into dialectical logic, you're not going to understand it. So I can't help, I can't help you if you're not willing to go into dialectical logic. It, you're just, it's, it would be, it would be the equivalent of, like, if I was a quantum physicist and I was trying to explain to someone um, uh, wave particle duality and someone was just like a particleist and saying, I'm not willing to go into this quantum logic. It's like, I can't help you. I can't help you. So if again, if you're not willing to go into the dialectical logic, I can't help you. Um, so again, novels are being written by something humans in relation to nothing, the void of their own recognition or desires and mediated by less than nothing, images. Like whenever you write anything, that's an image being translated into a symbolic medium. It's again, and you could understand that with the Lacanian triad of the symbolic imaginary and real. And then he says, does Zizek exist? No, Zizek does not exist. <clears throat> uh, so then now he goes on here uh, and says, um, what I think is important. Yeah. Okay. So now moving on, he says, he says, he explicitly says, I don't understand what dialectical materialism is. So here's the thing, like you're writing this article critiquing Zizek and Zizek is an expert in dialectical materialism, but you don't understand what dialectical materialism is. So again, you have to, it's like, you have to go, like you have to take a class, man. It's like you, like you don't understand what you're critiquing. So it's very, I mean, it, like you were like, for example, later in the article, he says um, that Zizek messes up his interpretation of quantum physics with, with uh, the Copenhagen interpretation. Um, and he's frustrated about this. He's saying Zizek is going outside of his topic. He doesn't understand quantum physics. He's going way outside of his topic and he's critiquing Zizek for this. But that's so paradoxical because he's doing that. Like he's not a dialectical materialist and he's critiquing one of the most prestigious and knowledgeable dialectical materialists. It's like, is there no cognitive dissonance here? Like, there I just, I, I'm not, again, it's not a personal attack on him. It's more personal frustration with this type of arrogance. It's like, it's mind-boggling arrogance. So... And now he brings up relevant quotes about dialectical materialism. And I could go each, I could go through each of these quotes one by one and give you sophisticated responses because I've spent so much time thinking about this. But, and you know, maybe I friggin' will. But um, here, like the first quote, he, and he's so critical, he's so, in my view, mindlessly critical of these things. But, um, like he pulls the first quote he references 
is actually a direct reference to Parmenides. It's like, like you're so arrogant you're critiquing Parmenides and you don't even know what Parmenides is saying? I've got to pull up all my strength. I've got to, I've got to muster a new strength here to go into this, you know, like it's madness. So, maybe I will go into this one by one. So, the minimal definition of dialectal materialism. If there is no one, just multiplicities and multiplicities, then the ultimate reality is the void itself. All determinate things are and are not. So, let me break this down. What does this mean? First, dialectical materialism operates on the subtraction of the one or monism. What this means is, is that dialectical materialism does not assume God or one reality. Does that make sense? That's one of the fundamental principles. But it's not just, it's not like, again, in Zizek's language, it's not like a Dawkins atheism where there's no God. It's a subtraction of the absolute. So God is less than nothing, basically. It's a subtraction of the one monism. The second principle of dialectical materialism assumes, from, again, from this passage here that he's quoting on Parmenides, uh, dialectical materialism assumes there's just a multiplicity of multiplicity relations between things. And this is actually consistent with another passage that he brings up in Absolute Recoil, which you're, you're confused about, or which this guy's confused about. So dialectical materialism assumes there's just a multiplicity of multiplicity relations between things. What that means is, okay, there's no God, there's no absolute reality. There's just material relations and it goes into before these material relations are ideal that's the paradox that's the paradox these ideal relations are just material they're formal relations uh he says dialectical material and then dialectical materialism includes that the ultimate reality is the void or you could say the ultimate reality is death so there's no absolute heaven or god or whatever santa claus uh, there's just material, ideal material relations, a multiplicity of multiplicities, that appear on the subtraction of the one, and the ultimate reality is just death. But this death here is internal to life and is being mediated by life. And that's why he says dialectical materialism suggests that all things are and are not. So you can again think about this, I think, in relationship, if I'm going to turn this into a scientific philosophy... You can think about this in relationship to either classical computation or quantum computation with ones and zeros, binary operators of one and zero. All things are and are not. So you could say they're one and zero or one, or you could say either either one and zero, either, either one or zero in the classical computation or in quantum computation, you say both one and zero. Um, and why? Because we're, we're, we are relations, material entities, some things in a mater materially relating. And the only ultimate reality is death, void. We're mediating our death. So like, for example, absolute negativity in Hegel or being towards death in Heidegger. Uh, and that's internal to life. And that's why, again, Zizek places so much emphasis on death drive. Um, so that's that quote. Um, it says, all somethings, so in this passage on Buddhism, all somethings exist from a subjective perspective of illusion. So what that means is all somethings are mediated by void, uh, mediated by the void by images. As I was saying earlier with the dialectical triad, all somethings exist from a subjective perspective of illusion. So there is no, there is no subject which has an objective view on everything. There is no one all. There is no one all. That's why he means that's another, again, later it says, makes a critique about objective reality. All of these require like a philosoph, like, like this guy needs to take a philosophy course, basically. I don't know. Maybe he is. I don't know. He, I, I actually don't know anything about his other than he's a philosopher of physics. That's the only thing I know about him. I tried to look up his papers. I couldn't find any of his papers online. But it's like all of these are very sophisticated philosophical statements he's going into. So, I mean... It's like, like I would want to sit down with him one by one and explain these to them, or like if I had the time, but it's like, or just watch my lectures, I guess. It's like I try to explain all these things. It's like, but uh, yeah, but it's just like, 
he goes into all the all all these different things. Like I, I I actually have written down answers for all of these 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 quotes that he has he has an issue with. Maybe I'll just go into what 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 his conclusions are. Um, so he he. I almost don't have the I don't have the patience almost. But there's just so many so many nuances. Again, like I'd say the major critique I have here is just that is that he's not an expert in dialectical materialism and he's critiquing the leading dialectical or one of the leading dialectical materialists on the planet. It's just that <clears throat> But I did okay. So, but I do break. I I have broken down a response to his his almost his arrogant conclusions about what Zizek's philosophy is. So he makes fun of Zizek, saying, "Oh, how can nothing exist and nothing does not exist?" Well, we already went through that. Uh, nothing things both exist and don't exist. It's a mediation of life and death. The self-repelling gap exists. That is, the self-repelling gap would be the movement of this, the 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 the, uh, the 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 self mediated by the void, filling a lack, constantly trying to fill a lack. That's the self-repelling gap, which is a precise cognitive mechanism. It's important, so important to understand that. Um, and then, objective reality does not exist. It's, objective reality is another form of less than nothing which is a useful historical fictional construct but it's useful it's useful but it's just not that it's just not like the a naive objective reality like a naive a naive scientific like a scientist who doesn't understand metaphysics or a scientist who doesn't understand ontology like basically saying then nothing is so my response to that is Again, nothing is being mediated by less than no, by the less than nothing of somethings, and it is a dialectical triad, and it is a complex geometry of logic. That's that's. Then he goes into to, he, then he critiques absolute recoil. Um, let me just go into. And he's very cons like he, like this guy seems to suggest that that. Thomas Muller seems to suggest that there's no consistency, but there's, again, there's extreme consistency. It just, it requires an expertise knowledge. Like, and you, and, and again, on this whole article, it's so ridiculous. He's basing, he's saying the left should disconnect, and this is, this is low-level philosophy, because he doesn't understand it. It's absurd. So his dialectical materialism transposes back into nature, not subjectivity as such, but the gap that separates subjectivity from objective reality. Precisely. So what he's saying is, is that the focus should be on the way in which the subject is separated from objective reality, subtraction of the negative one, not uh, this naive relationship between the subject and objective reality. It's the very gap that we should be focused on, the lack we try to fill in ourself, which is, and that's my critique of th this author, this author is projecting the gap. So here, I'll use Zizek's own philosophy against this guy, saying, like, what dialectical materialism does is transpose back into nature, so in me in relation to this guy, not subjectivity as such, but the very gap that separates subjectivity from objective reality. So my thing is that this guy is not seeing his own gap. He's not seeing that, like, his own gap is that he doesn't understand dialectical materialism. And he's critique, and the, he's not reflective on this gap. Like, the, the, the proper response should be, well, maybe I should learn something about dialectical materialism before I write an entire article on current affairs about how the greatest dialectical materialist uh, is a, a fraud and a charlatan. And he's racist, by the way. It's like, dude. Madness. It's madness. So for dialectical materialism, the subject is... I'll go through the shorter ones because I have time for that. For dialectical materialism, the subject is prior to the process of subjectivization. The process fills in the void, the empty form that is the pure subject. So the pure subject has no content. The pure subject is the absence itself. It doesn't fill itself up with anything. So food or sex or whatever it is your articles, all of that's all ego. 
Like this article you've written is your ego that you, you filled up the emptiness of yourself with this symbolic structure. So it's not the pure form of yourself. This is, this is, this is the process of subjectivization which has done this. Blah, blah, blah. So dialectical materialism does not posit just the original multiplicity of being. For dialectical materialism, one has to think two prior to multiplicity. That's a, an important dialectical point. Again, because in modern, and I think, and again, this is an important thing for, the, for modern leftists to think. Because mo, most, and again, I was, my argument is leftists have to think their philosophy from the philosophical ground up. And I think one of the things that, that modern leftists do oftentimes is they think multiplicity prior to two. So they always try to deconstruct binary oppositions. But they just don't understand binary oppositions. They don't understand the way, because bin binary oppositions are operating in a very subtle, complex, asymmetrical form. It takes, but you have to think this too before you think the multiplicity. So for take, take, take for example, in regards to capitalism, class antagonism. Or take for example, in, re in regards to sexual division, uh, or sexuation, sexual division between masculine and feminine. You have to think the two before you think the multiplicity. So it's not just this original multiplicity of being, and that's always what progressive leftists will do. They'll try to go back to the original multiplicity of being, but that's imaginary. You have to think the two first. You have to think the antagonism within the process. Um, the position of dialectical materialism is that there's no peace even in the void. The reason why there's no peace even in the void is because it's not just a simple nothing. It's, 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 it's a nothing filled with less than nothing. It's like the quantum void. It's not. It's like the difference between Newtonian void and quantum void. Newtonian void is just like like a like an abstract nothingness. And then in the quantum void, you cannot think this anymore. So again, so I, I'm going to end just by what he's saying here about Zizek's intellectual honesty. So, and I just transpose it back into his own intellectual honesty here. Like, because if this guy was being intellectually honest, he would say, you know what, guys, I just, I don't understand why Zizek is popular. Like, if he was the honest, he was to say, I don't, and he has some honest statements in this article, but he's saying, what would be honest would be in saying, look, I don't understand Zizek. I don't understand why he's so popular. I have some, 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 some of my own speculations about why he's popular, about why uh, why people like him, but I'm not sure. And if I'm honest, and if I if I if I look at the 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 uh, theorists, I would have to read in order to understand Zizek, Hegel, Lacan, Freud, Marx. I don't really understand these people either, and I don't have the time to read them. And I don't know what dialectical materialism is. Like it would just be it would it would be transposing the it would be just him looking at his own gap basically. But of course, he doesn't do that. He basically says, Zizek isn't really that smart. And it's like, dude, come on. And then, of course, he has to, I think he's doing fake posturing with the quantum physics thing. Because of course, in modern standard scientific philosophy, like, understanding quantum physics is like the the like you're smart if you understand modern quantum physics and you're dumb if you don't so he says Zizek isn't really smart because apparently according to this guy Zizek doesn't really understand quantum physics I don't have time to go into the 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 article the the, the chapter Zizek has, has has written about quantum physics but basically saying that Zizek uh gives a unpopular version of the Copenhagen interpretation that he goes wildly off topic talking about sexuation talking about Hamlet talking about obscure philosophy of Ray Brazier how how does thought think the death of thought itself it's like you know it's just and then ultimately says that Zizek is nothing different than a postmodern essay generator. So, I mean, this video has probably been really long, but I really feel like I needed to get this off my chest because this article is, you know, I mean, I'm happy it was written just because it gave me a chance to sort of see how a certain academic cognitive predisposition would encounter Zizek and be frustrated by him. Um, 
but the main thesis of the the article that that Zizek is a charlatan and the left should abandon him and Zizek is racist um, or Zizek is reaction like I would say like one the evidence you marshaled that Zizek is racist is like there's nothing there there's no substance there there's nothing about race specifically that Zizek is here you have nothing. It's again one of the r most ridiculous dimensions of the modern left where they'll just they'll call anyone racist. Like if there's anything a little culturally insensitive, you're racist. Like and again, it's all within the intersectional hierarchy dynamics that this operates, which I think is the real theology here. Um and then calling Zizek reactionary when he's just, in my view, he's just dialectical. He's actually taking the time to dialecticize the left and right, which is nothing wrong with that. And then he says Zizek is an academic charlatan because of, you know, because he uses, because he, he references Hegel and Lacan a lot. And because he has cited Wikipedia a few times. And because he's, 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 you, he's, re, he's recycled some of his own uh, paragraphs. It's like... <sighs> But if anyone here is the academic charlatan, it's this guy. Because he, he, he doesn't even understand. And again, I don't want to go to, it, it's, not a, it, it's not a personal, it's, I would never, I don't want to hear, it's not a personal attack on him. Because it's, like, because I don't know his work. Like, I would have to read his work, and like, I would be interested in reading his work. But I don't, I can't find his work. Um, but I would be interested in reading his work. But what I'm saying is about him being, him being an academic charlatan, he doesn't understand this topic. Like, the best thing to do would be to go to someone who's an expert in this topic and to learn about it from them. So, that's the end of the video. I said I needed to comment on this, and I hope this was useful as a response to this current affairs article. Um, thanks for watching, if you're still with me.